But if you can find an area that has a little bit of a natural pinch point to it, but then has two long points coming out of each other, to me that's the ultimate because that funnels on this way. How many people think about funnel points as something from top to bottom, not just left and right? Well, if it comes like this and a big portion of that creek arm is a lot shallower than the rest of that creek arm, as them fish move through there, they've got to get condensed this way too. And that really condenses them. And what that does is, is that condenses the bait fish when they come through there, it puts them in an ultimate ambush point where they don't have much space to run. Okay? Like, you can only pinch it so hard this way, those bait fish can still move. But they can't move very far when that pinch point drops up to four or five feet and they got nowhere to go. And so those bass will use those as what I like to call stop signs. Well, when they find that, especially if they come across there while there's bait on it, they're going to set up on there and feed and feed and feed as the bait moves in and out of that funnel point from top to bottom. And you can find these in a lot of, a lot of ways in subtle areas. Um, Lake of the Pines is one of my favorite lakes. And I don't know why this is sticking in my head, but this is, this is the one that's sticking in my head right now. And I know there's a bunch of them out here, but for whatever reason, this Lake of the Pines one is sticking in my head. So if you know kind of the Han Point area of Lake of the Pines, you follow back here, get right in front. Y'all know that big mountain on the north end of Lake of the Pines? What? When you follow the water and get as close to that as you can on the water, when you go into there, there's like this open area. It's got timber, scattered timber in it and grass and everything. And then there's another little gap that kind of runs this way, and it's a little bit deeper water. And it, there's no timber in that one. Well, right between those two areas, there's a ridge that runs all the way across there that pinches those fish down vertically. And boys, I'm going to tell you something. In the fall, you might catch a hundred of them right there. Like every year in the fall they just as those fish are moving all across those big grass flats chasing bait around they get condensed on that vertical funnel point and they go crazy on them so these are things that you guys have to do and listen this day and time there's no excuse to not be prepared there's more information than there's ever been we try to give you as much info as we can but you guys can look up navionics web app on your phone you have this is more powerful than the computer that Ronald Reagan ran the free world with. Does everybody realize that? So it can surely do whatever you need it to do for fishing. You understand what I'm saying? Like if this ran the free world in the 80s, it can help you get ready for a tournament. Okay, so use it. Navionics web app, Google Earth, um, all these things like this. There's all different map services out there that you can look at um, and, and use that and go pre-plan and find these funnel points when you're prepping for a tournament. I know it's too late for you guys to prep for tomorrow. I understand that, but you got another one coming up. And there's no excuse to not prep for it and not know where everything that you're looking for is. So if you've got a fall tournament and you're looking for funnel points, you can go map those out and find those ridges that run way out into the creek that maybe condense it vertically, not just horizontally. And if you can find one that does both, hey, you've really got something there. I want to get to some questions. I hope you guys have a lot of questions because that's always my favorite part of these deals is the question and answer. But before I do, I just want to say, man, this is the coolest part to me. And listen. I love and appreciate every one of you guys that come here. But look at all these young guys in here right now. You know, they they might have showed up a little late, but hey, look at all these young guys. I mean, Folks, this is the future of our sport. This right is here. a full house tonight, by the way. Oh, it's way full. It's overflowing. And hey, all you high school guys, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank all of you guys so much for coming in here tonight. It means so much that you guys actually want to take the time to listen to what we have to say. Um, and I want to help you every way I can. I think that what you guys are involved in is a great great thing for our sport i think it's a great thing i think being outside is a great thing for you going forward in your life i think it's going to influence you in positive ways and i really think this this high school fishing deal is a big deal uh for the young people of this generation especially the young people involved in the outdoors like we all love to be uh so thank you guys for coming up here so much i know we've got a little bit of high school fishing i don't know what royalty i don't know we've got anglers of the year from one of the big divisions right over there one of the dallas divisions anglers of the year have come in the house tonight they're not in y'all's division but they're in one of the Dallas divisions. I know their dad, and they won Angler of the Year last year, so nice. kudos to them. Those guys are... All right, questions? When they sign up for they the tournament, so. watch out. Uh, <laughs> questions? Fire Any questions. Ain't no, there is no such thing as a dumb question either. I don't know. That one you asked me the other day. Oh, no. <laughs> what? No, I said, can you catch more than five fish? Oh. Is that That's all I need is five, right, guys? Where's my tournament guys? You only need five, right? <laughs> Do the right five. I got a question about yes, Did you get... Did you get his movement 80 the other night when you were on the video? I, I was I was no. attempting to try to get the hooks off of it so I could get it in my pocket. No. I, I swear, man, he was guarding us with his life. I, no. I, I think he threatened me. 
if I took it. I can tell you had a look on his face. I wanted yeah, to. I wanted to. Because I had it in my mind. I said, he, yeah, he'd be, he be had a better chance to steal one of my kids than he would that country. And I, you notice on the video that I asked him, how deep does it dive? And he says, it's consistent. It won't go any deeper than two foot. And that spot I was fishing yesterday on that guy trip, I'm thinking, man, that thing would have been bad to the boat. <laughs> Especially when those fish blew up. And I'm thinking, God, I wish I'd have got it. Yeah, no, I ain't turned loose with my moving 80 Xs. That, that, no, uh-uh. <laughs> I will put in a standard order though for six of them whenever uh, they come available. Color on the, that that bait is insanely perfect. Yeah, really insanely perfect. That's one of the neatest looking baits. And I, like you talked about last night with that wider bill on the front, um, I mean it def the deflection rate is going to be a lot lot better. Um, it's an unbelievable bait. There's no doubt. It just caught a lot of big fish. All right, I know there's got to be some questions. We always have structure questions, water tank yeah. questions. Questions, questions. Oh boy, I tell you what, we have the smartest crew ever known to man. <laughs> well, we didn't talk very long tonight. We're not going there. Well, I'll try to leave some room for them to ask. Nobody's got any questions. Yeah. Yeah. What about your uh, square wheel crankbaits? Mm -hmm. uh, what about six foot of water? Yeah. What I say about right now. Yeah, so if I was going to fish square bills, uh, and, and I don't think that square bills are a bad thing to fish. In fact, I think along with that quarter ounce lipless bait that I'm talking about I think if if you wanted to go out there with like a 1.5 or you know with six cents it's the cr old crush 50x the original one um, there's absolutely a bite on that on the smaller profile square bills right now um, but you got to get outside the grass the grass isn't growing you know out to five and six and seven foot like it does sometimes the grass most of the grass almost all the grass on the lake is going to stop growing in about two or three foot right now maybe four at the most so you got to get on that outside edge because you, you want to be banging, but you don't want to be bogging. And right. if you get up in two foot of water with that square bill, you're going to bog down to the bottom of that grass. It's not going to work very well. So you got to get right outside that grass, and there are some good fish. And, and those those schools of fish will chase that bait out of that grass. And we're fishing that lipless bait outside the grass at times when they're telling on themselves and showing them to us. So if you wanted to go banging it off every piece of timber outside the grass line that you could, I don't think that's a bad idea. No. Would that be the same with the movement ADX? Well, the movement ADX doesn't dive as deep, so I actually fish that over the grass edge. Uh, the school, yeah. We the just drove in from Arkansas. To, I got you. To see this, we wanted to be here and, and observe this, of course, but we hit the water tomorrow, so yeah, we're looking for any tips Absolutely. too. Well, I don't want to interrupt. No, a, little little bit, a lot of that'll be a little bit more difficult too. If you find an area where there's coontail grass, it's a much softer vegetation. Oh, yeah. Boy, those things will wrap around. The ends of the baits and That's stuff like that. Mostly, uh, mostly what we have right now is yeah, a lipless crankbait though will come through it a lot better. Sure. And yeah, like he's talking about a quarter ounce or a three eighths because most of the grass here on the lake right now, if you find any, and it could be in any given pocket on the lake, is fairly shallow. I mean, and that's what I was talking about. The one spot I went and looked at yesterday where there was three, three and a half foot deep grass in there, it's gone, totally gone. And the hammer's still working good. The, ha oh, the jackhammer. Yeah, it's still getting some bites. You know, the moving bite has gotten tougher. Um, like David was saying, with the cooling temps and the cooling trends, the moving bait bite has gotten tougher, with the exception of, you know, that quarter ounce lipless crankbait is catching the smaller fish. But for you just coming out here fun fishing, you're probably coming down to Lake Fork to catch some of the bigger fish. And so for you, I would suggest, you know, slow down. Slow down with that Texas rig uh, and, and maybe forgo some of those moving baits because that chatterbait will get you some bites, but it's not a lot, and it's not like it was. Yeah, the, the, the deal usually when the water temp is 63, 62 to 65, <clears throat> the morning, a moving bait in the morning, you might as well not even bring it out. It's gonna be a yeah. tough, tough, tough road to hoe if you're trying to throw that in the morning. But I will say at three o'clock. Yeah, that's true. Three o'clock till seven o'clock or dark, game on. And I'll date back whenever we had some grass here a few years ago, uh, up in Glade, matter of fact, and uh, I would only book a half day trip uh, that in particular time, and we were throwing lipless crankbaits in there, and it was in February. And those fish, there was two caveats that, that ruled that, and it had to be three o'clock or later, and the water temp had to be 50 or higher. And when we went in there with those, that combination, we caught between, say, eight to 25 bass every day over five pounds. Whenever those two criteria were met in that area over that grass on a little crankbait, I'd get in there earlier and uh, try it, try it, and try it, and you just couldn't get bit. And then there was this one in particular hump that had a point on it that had a little bit of grass on it. And the client that I had, we threw and threw and threw and threw on it, you know, and we were working down a grass edge. But I worked that thing pretty good. And that's getting to be 5 o'clock. Going a little further, I'm about 80 yards away. And here comes two boats running in there. And they one guy stops there, one guy goes further back. 
And so we're, we're casting, we're casting. Next thing I know, I see that guy in that boat and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, what is going on over there? Something happened. And I kept watching him, kept watching him, kept watching him. And he's not doing anything. He's back in the back. And I thought, this guy's got, he's in trouble. Let's go back. So we're, we get back on troll motor and we get close to him. When I get up there to him, I said, uh, sir, is there, you got a problem I can help you with? He said, you got a scale? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, I got a good one. And I'm like, okay. So I pull up there, I get in this boat with a scale, I weigh it, 1210, all right? Caught it on that exact spot that we had just made 20 minutes worth of casts on, and he was throwing a different color rattle trap. And I'm like, no, don't do that to me. My client looks at me and he says, it's your fault. It's your fault. Right. <laughs> but uh, to make sure, I want to make sure we answer your question. Right? So on the Movement ADX, you can fish it over grass, but what I'm going to tell you is you don't want to make long casts, and you want to hold your rod tip up. Normally with the crank will hold a rod tip down. But that grass that is really shallow, I have been able to fish it over there effectively, and it does get some bigger bites for us. It doesn't get as many as the lipless does, but it will get us a bigger bite. But I'm having to make a medium distance cast and hold my rod tip up and slow down a little bit, because the harder you dig that build crankbait, the more it's going to want to dig. So we just kind of throw it up and almost fish it like a sub wake bait, where it's only going about this deep. Because I don't got a lot of line out, I'm slowing it down, I'm holding my rods about that keeps it, you know, just under the surface, and you can fish it over that grass. Yeah. You run it into anything you can. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm everything that's hard. Anything that I can hit that's hard, whether it's you know flooded bushes, willow tree, whether it's a stump, a lay down, anything that's hard that I can get that thing to bounce off of, that's a hundred percent the key to getting it's my amazing. It's amazing the deflection quality of that bait is amazing. Well, and that even goes for shallow grass. Uh, these guys yesterday, I've spent a lot of the day teaching them about, you know, the and when they cast about how to work the bait. I mean, the, these guys were novices. They were just itching to learn, and they'd make the cast, and you'll see a lot of times people will just throw, and they'll just turn on that handle, and they'll just turn on it, turn on it, turn on it, and nothing happens, and they get burned out. Well, we were throwing swim jigs. That's one of the, I grew up on Rayburn and Toledo Bend a lot back in the days, and a lot of hydrilla there, a lot of grass, and we use swim jigs a lot with great success. Well, it also works insanely good here too. Mm -hmm. And I had them tied on yesterday. Mm -hmm. And when I noticed that I picked one up and then I started throwing it, well then they'll watch as I'm turning it and all of a sudden I'm turning it about this speed and then I'll speed it up a little bit and then I'll slow it down, drop the rod tip a little bit, raise the rod tip, just exactly what he's talking about. And the object to this is, is you have to make that bait contact the grass. It has to touch, and ideally you want it touching the top of the grass. You don't want it bogged down deep, but you don't want it riding high. Yeah. Active fish riding high may come up and get it, but if the fish are inactive, especially like they were yesterday, that was the, the key to it. And as soon as I picked that up, made five or six or seven casts with it, and I'm feeling it through there, all of a sudden one, boom, he hit it, and I waited to load the rod. Now that's the key scenario. You just, on the first initial slam, you just don't go ahead and rear back. I waited for the, the tip to get heavy, and it didn't. I reeled it back in, I looked, the bait was all right, so I cast it right back in the same spot, and I told the guy, man, I just had one knock slack in the line. I made about three cranks with it, same thing. Boom, he hit it, and I waited, and the rod got heavy, set the hook, call it, with the, with the, swim, with the swim jig. And yeah. so, contact the grass, no matter whether it's coontail or whether it's hydrilla, just make sure and work that rod. You might work that rod up and down, but you want it doing that and you you your retrieval speed will almost never be the same and i'll take that even for a chatterbait also mm -hmm. i agree what size was that what size are you throwing to keep that up on top of the grass quarter ounce quarter yep i'll have usually when i know that they're hitting swim jigs good and i know that the even and i'll use it on 15 pound line and i have a quarter a three eighths and a half tied on and it a lot of times a half's going to be on places where i know that the grass is deeper and if the fish are out on the outside edge it's just what he said a while ago some places if it's four foot which tough to find some four foot there are a couple of places yeah. and then that's where you would want to target that if they're on the outside edge of the grass still feeling it all the way to the outside edge most of those yesterday uh were in you know most of the fish i've been catching have been one to two and a half foot of water, yeah. you know, but also too, that's why the yesterday was interesting because of the cold front situation. As the water stabilizes and then the sun will heat it for a couple of days, unfortunately a front what, rolls in today. So we didn't get that extra day of warming, had that water had turned a little more and we'd have bought at least another half a day of sun and warming, it had been game on. And it just turns those fish on just like that. So it's capitalizing on what you know about what mother nature presents to you.
So two foot of water, so to speak. Yep. How, what, what hot does your grass level there? It depends. Some places it's all the way to the surface. So as you're working that bed across the top, how much is it getting in that grass? It's getting in it. Because it's, it's yes. wearing you out no. every time you're pulling A it swim out jig will not wear you out. Okay. Swim jigs go through it very, very, very so nicely. So back to the chatterbait then? Chatterbait is, is going to be more in the scattered grass to the outside edge. And you may, just what Billy said a while ago, you may have to get up closer to it and then parallel it and throw it down the lines, you know, as far as that goes. But I like to take the swim jig, especially <clears throat> where the grass is thicker, and we did that yesterday, throw it up into the thick, thick stuff. It don't hang up or nothing, but it's knocking its way through the grass, and it might call them out of that shallow water to a brake line. I'll tell you a little tip for throwing a swim jig or a swim bait in grass. Uh, if you're having to throw it in that grass and it's, you know, up to the surface and you know you're gonna be having to work that through some thicker grass, and you don't wanna wear yourself out. There's a real simple way to not do that. Um, what you can do is, when you make your cast, point your, your rod straight down the line. No angle of the line coming out. So here's your last rod tip. You don't want the line going this way at all. You want that line coming directly out of your rod tip as you point it and you reel. When you do that, it takes all the bend out of your rod and it applies direct pressure to that bait. As soon as it hits that grass, you'll feel it stop it, just keep reeling, and it'll kind of bog down for a second and it'll pop through but it applies direct pressure to that grass, allows no shock absorption, and that grass won't pull and wad up around your bait as much, and it'll bulldog its way right through the grass. Especially with a weedless swim bait, you'll be amazed at what you can reel it through just pointing it down the line. And a swim jig, every once in a while it'll get your hook a little bit, cause you, but most of the time, especially if you do that and you use braid, man, you can reel it through almost anything. You just point right at it and just bulldog it through anything you want to. A pointed, the swim jig too has got more of a pointed head to it, rather than a blunt head and that makes it work through the stuff a lot cleaner as far as that goes now even in that situation right there and this is what i was asking too about that swim bait deal a lot of times what i'll do is i'll take a swim bait on there and most people use a belly weight on it certain swim baits will allow you to put like a 3 16 or a quarter ounce tungsten in front of a 5 odd hook and certain swim baits will not only will the tail kick but the body will wobble like this and boy that can be an extra added bonus on drawing a strike and when you throw it up into that thick grass like that it's you most people want to feel something you almost can't feel anything because it just won't hang up on the grass at can, all little, little tip too i just changed a lot of my moving bait rods uh over to braid this week uh it's the time of year to start putting that braid <clears> on those rods and i'm gonna tell you why as we go forward in the grass, we'll start to now start, we're kind of at our peak grass levels. The grass will start to die back a little bit as the water gets colder and colder. And that grass, as it gets less healthy, will get softer. Well, that becomes harder to, that, that makes it want to bog down and wrap around your bait more. It's like, that's why Hydrilla, everybody, you know, one of the reasons Hydrilla is so much better than Coontail is it has a firmer, stiffer stem, which makes it easier to rip baits or pop baits out of. Well, as the grass starts to get softer, especially with this Coontail as we get colder and colder, you're going to need that braid. You're going to want that braid. It's going to make your life a lot easier to work that bait through that grass if you have that braid. For me, on like chatter baits, lipless baits, all that, I actually use 30 pound braid. I don't use the big heavy braid, even though we catch big fish. I use 30 pound braid. I use a rod that's got a lot of bow in it because when you put braid on a bait with treble hooks, you better have a rod that's got some tip on it or you're going to rip it out away from a lot of fish because that braid has zero stretch. It's a whale rope. But with 30 pound braid, the reason I go down to 30 pound is because when I'm specifically trying to rip a bait out of grass, get it in grass and rip it out, that 30 pound braid has a thinner diameter than 50 pound braid. A thinner knife is easier to cut something with than a thick wide knife, right? So that thinner braid will actually rip through and cut that grass much more efficiently. Be amazed how much more efficiently, because it's, it's a fine line of that and all the grass is gone or you don't catch fish when you're doing this. You catch fish when you do when you do that. That's when you get that reaction bite. When you can make that bait go, brrr, pow, that's when you get that bite. You use that on a bait caster or a spinning rod. Bait caster, I you know he uses spinning rods a little on drop shot. <clears throat> I I don't use spinning I rods. I personally don't use it. I hate them. Yeah, my I client, I, got, I have six or eight of them for my clients. Six or eight. Six or eight spinning, spinning rods for clients that can't use bait casters. Right. But I don't. There's no technique that I actually use a spinning rod on for myself. Um, you know, for me, you can always pick up so much more line with a bait caster and have so much more control over the fish with a bait caster than you can with a spinner rod. It's awkward to me because I've fished my whole life with bait casters. Uh, I'm not real efficient at picking up the line when I need to. And man, these fish out here, they will whip your tail. <laughs> Just a few years ago, the, the 
braided line on a bait cap that you've got 30 pounds or less, it buries itself. And you set the hook and then you cast it out and bang, it breaks yep. off. And they're hard. How well, do you keep it from burying when you... If you, if you set the hook really hard, it will. Mm -hmm. It will. Yeah. And you can't keep it from doing that. Um, and you got to just be cognizant of that. So for whatever reason, if you set the hook real hard on something, uh, you got to know that it buried and you're going to want to ease into that cast and then pull that. If you manually pull it, it'll free it. But the deal is with these lipless baits or these chatter baits, all these moving baits that we're fishing this grass, there's none of them that I'm going to tell you that you should be just stepping back and rearing into them on. All these baits, when you set the hook on these fish, so you're throwing it out there and you pop it out of the ground, pop, and you feel that bite, you just keep reeling until you feel the load, and then you turn and burn the reel handle. Uh, I, very rare will you, like I won't ever on a moving bait, like step back and do like a big hook set like I do on, you know, a flipping bait or a football jig out deep or something like that. It's kind of a, a turn and really dig it in with the reel handle. And, and what I always tell my clients is, I want you to pull hard, I just don't want you to jerk. Like, I don't want there to be a sudden snap like there is on a Texas rig or something. I want you to just pull into them and then start reeling as fast as you can and pull as hard as you can. And if you'll do that, your line doesn't dig in there as bad, and it doesn't become an issue. And the reason the line digging in is not why I say to do that. The reason I say to do that is because with no stretch on that braid, it makes it your life a lot easier to fish in grass, but you will lose fish if you go to herking and jerking on them or if you don't have a rod that doesn't have enough tip. Like, you need that tip, and you need to ease into that hook set a little bit. Or you'll lose a lot of fish. More of the rod than you are the line attack. Right. It's it's yeah. You're loading it up. Right. Right. The line's there to help you with the grass, but you it kind of works against you when you get a fish on. So you got to manage it. How do you feel about the black and white? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you won a lot of tournaments. Yeah. With Sam Rayburn with it. Not yet, but heck and I'm yeah, I'm talking man. 25, 30 pound bags. Certain times of the year, man. Absolutely. The uh, second biggest fish anybody's ever put in the boat with me was caught on a wacky, wacky rig trip worm with a half nail in the head. What, um, what would y'all recommend? I know y'all are in between here, but I'm asking color. You said it really don't matter, but what would y'all recommend on a lake for as far as for me, color? It's, for me, it's real simple. It's green with sparkle. <laughs> and it can be red sparkle, it can be blue sparkle, but green with some sparkle. David, you're more precise. Well, yeah, that. I mean, for finesse, I mean, uh, like I say, the, the the water that's off color, using like a a, a a green pumpkin magic, something like that. I mean, is for for. But if the water's a lot clearer, I'm going to use watermelon candy red. If the water's clearer, and especially in sunshine, yeah, and, watermelon and candy red is one of my favorite colors. It is my favorite color yeah, also. But, but 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 if it's even really sunshiny, you know, I mean, I'm going to use a, a red bug. I'll throw red bug up there because red coming into this time of year is is a natural. Like crawfish are starting to change color, all of the, the things like that. But it, it has a big impact. That's why they go to red rattle traps when the water starts to cool. Do you or both of y'all? Y'all use weights on the end, one end of your wacky worm, or any of it? I put weights. I put weights, and I'll adjust the weights. Story about that. My partner on Rayburn, I used to fish with, was probably the consummate wacky worm expert. Uh, that guy stomped on me a lot, and th and Jack, Jack is freaking out right now. How competitive he is! We were fishing a tournament one time, and he is scalding me on this. We're fishing this one pattern, and I mean, he's got to be beating me six, seven, eight to one, you know. And I, I watch him. He he'd, he'd slung one of them off, and I watch him over there, and that little wiry son of a gun is stuffing three nails in the end of that wacky worm. Yeah. And I'm, I've only got one in there, you know. That was a long time ago when this happened. And I'm like, you know, and I mean, like, light bulb. I'm like, sure, you know, that was back in the learning days way back, you know. But I start to control now my depth. And that's what you want to do. Use the nails to control the depth. And I even went as far as buying a gram scale. And now I'm going to weigh them. I want to know, you know, what they weigh. Because two of the small ones equal one of the big ones on the gram scale. And so if I'm fishing a little bit deeper, uh, one of those nails goes in a lot better, the ones that come in the package. Right. River City, whatever the name is. Bunker City. Bunker City that has them. And putting one nail in there will keep Just the worm intact. Side. When he's stuffing three of those little nails in there, it's, it, it, yeah. it can split it. And also, too, the downside to it is uh, that when you – we always used to hook it in the plastic. Well, you make a hard cast with it, it's going to pull it out. Yeah. I saw a guy – this ain't no joke. Yesterday, day before yesterday, when we, we put the boats on a trailer, they had a pretty good day on a wacky worm here. And a, you know, we were walking over. He said, yeah, come look at this. And what is he putting on this wacky worm but a split ring instead of the rubber O-ring? He said it works way better. 
and so he's using a number two split ring on it, and then putting his hook inside the split ring. Oh, well, how did that done? You know, was, was he in the middle or more up towards the top? You know, I always hook him up closer to the egg sac. I want a little bit more weight forward, and you have to really draw a good picture in your mind of what that thing looks like when it goes down there, if you're fishing in grass or how it's coming out of the grass. But if I want a different fall to it, I'm going to put use a Cinco and put it right in the middle. Why are you laughing? <laughs> because, first of all, he doesn't even know how to spell wacky worm. He's never used one in his entire life. And if he did no, use one... No, I just one, don't use a drop shot. I use a wacky worm religiously. But, but if he did use a wacky worm, it's going to be one of these ones down there that are 12 inch long and the size of a wacky worm. I did talk about using a magnum crawler as a wacky worm. Uh, no, I do. It's real similar. Um, the Lunker City Nail Weights do... The ribs on those longer seating always provide a big advantage because what he said, throwing them out. And those ribs will help keep them in. Uh, everything pretty much that I know about a wacky worm, I learned from my buddy Zach Wolf. And that dude's caught many double digit fish. For a guy that only fishes on the week, worm. for a guy that only fishes on the weekends, this dude's caught a bunch of double digit fish on a wacky worm. Um, but what we do is we take the longer seating nail weights and we pitch them in half and we put them in there. That's our standard operating procedure. Now, if it's really windy, or if we're fishing a little bit deeper, we'll put the whole nail weight in there. Um, but, you know, it, this is what's great about, and I love this when we when we disagree on things, because I think it goes to show how there's no absolutes in fishing, and it, a lot of times you gotta take the information we give you and translate it to what works best for you. Right. For me, and it's probably because, like I said, I, I learned a lot about it from Zach, and Zach believes the same way. We never put an O-ring on a trick worm, ever. And the trick worm is such a light deal with that half a nail weight and that little bee hook that we're using and all that, uh, that even the weight of an O-ring can affect the action of that bait when you're folding it in half and all that. Um, and so we just prefer to put just the hook in. And our hook placement is a little bit below the egg sac. Uh, there's two reasons we do that. One, it folds the worm over more than half when you pull on it and it gives it a sharper action. Um, the other reason is when you catch a couple of fish and it wears it whole, you can slide it closer to the egg sack and then, it, you know, you can just conserve your worm, I guess you might say, a little bit. I always Maybe. put it in a plastic also. I don't use any kind of O-ring at all. I never have. You use no ring I never use one. The yeah. guy yesterday had it and I thought it was kind of interesting. That is I'd never interesting. Seen I've never seen anybody, that. I'd never seen anybody use an O-ring before. I mean, a uh, split, ring. split ring. ring. So I thought it was kind of interesting, but uh, I'll, if it's real shallow water, I mean, like if I'm throwing that in two, three foot, I'll take one of those nails and break it in half, all right, the small nail. Yeah. If the water's three to five foot, I'll use one nail. If the water's deeper than five foot, I'll usually use two of those nails, all right? And then if we're fishing around bridge pilings or something like that, generally two nails. We've won a lot of tournaments on Sam Rayburn using even heavier than that in 20 foot of water on a wacky one. Yeah. I've never fished a wacky worm in 20 foot of water, but the guy that taught me, Zach, he does it. I've watched him do it many times and catch good fish on 20 foot of water on that wacky worm. Um, yeah, the, you just you didn't realize this, but that's like the one fist finesse technique that I do fish you like do. a yeah. lot. I have a lot more respect for you now. <laughs> <laughs> I have less respect for myself because I'm owning up to finesse fishing, so it works out. It's all equal in the end. All right, any more questions? Man, what a great night it's been. I cannot thank you guys enough. Having all the young guys here, like I said, means a lot to me. We've got a gentleman here just drove in from Arkansas uh, hanging out with us. That is, it's unbelievable to watch where this thing has gone over the last few years. And, and don't you worry, we're going to keep going. It's, it's, we've got some exciting things coming going forward. I've got, as I usually like to do, if you follow the last couple of years, I always like to kind of make it interesting on January 1st and announce something that you know is fairly significant to us and our business. And, and we've got another one coming this January 1st, so stay tuned for that. Um, and, and just keep watching the, the channel the way y'all do and, and keep helping us grow it. And we will forever, ever, ever be in debt to you guys. Thank y'all so much. Thank Lake Fort Brandon. David, thank oh, man, you very I much. I greatly appreciate it. And we'll see you guys in two weeks if you're around. Appreciate it.